I think that was a, this is test number one. Now test two, next week we'll have them start moving on to the Hebrew town names found in the Old Testament. That'll be fun to watch, wouldn't it? You know, it, it, it makes a pastor excited and nervous when he has scripture reading with all these odd names and words and, and you hand it to somebody and say, good luck. You know, when I was a kid, I remember looking back at the early church, the times of old, and wishing that I could be in that church. Everything was new. The church was uh, moving along well. Everybody was getting along, taking care of all those who had need. I got that from Acts chapter 2, verse 44. It said, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute is proceed, the proceeds to all as any had need. In my mind, I had this picture of this healthy, vibrant community, all living together, supporting one another, taking care of everything, and nobody had a need, and everybody was happy. I imagine this was a church free of rancor and strife that, that I saw growing up and that we've seen in our lives. A church where there was no division. Everyone was in one accord. There's a dad joke in there somewhere. We're going to let it go. I suppose this image was also fed by the Genesis story of Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall, where everything was perfect. Adam and Eve had all they needed until sin crept in, until they did what was wrong and were forced out of the garden. I imagine this early church was sort of this new start and everything was perfect. That's something that time lost. However, today's passage just shoots all sorts of holes in my utopian dream when I was young. Today we're going to look about how our faith becomes complicated and competitive. We're going to look at the nature of what causes some of our strife and how we can best address it and get rid of it. And we'll see if we can bring things back to a center once again. Let us, though, begin with prayer. Gracious God, as we open your word and ponder its meanings, we pray for your spirit to be a lamp unto our feet and to guide us, to illuminate our hearts and our minds and bringing us understanding, drawing us closer to you, God, to one another, drawing us closer to who you called us to be. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, it really is our nature to make things complicated. It's our nature to want to pick things apart, to divide and to parse out, to dig deeper, to understand more. It's not that we really like things complicated and difficult, it's just our nature. We do tend to major in the minors way too often, to make mountains out of molehills, to wonder just how many angels can dance on the head of a pit. It's our nature to have these questions, to move in that direction, to want to know more. Before we look at how and why we complicate things, let me begin with the core of our belief. Let us begin with our foundation. What is the foundation of our faith? Can you sum it up and say 250 words or less? Yeah. Now, that just took us ministers in the room out of the equation because we're, uh, we are in the firm belief as ministers that there is never ever a good reason uh, to say anything in 250 words when 10,000 words would suffice. <laughs> so the ministers are out of this equation, but can you Sum up your faith, our faith, in 250 words or less. The What's that? The wow, somebody's on it. Hang on, hold that thought. Okay. Where would you begin this foundational statement? Remember, this is a statement that we want to use to make sure that all people shared a common faith. So your own personal views would only interfere <coughs> with this exercise. If you're having difficulty coming up with a foundational statement of your faith, don't worry. So did our early church fathers as they tried to come up with our foundational faith. Eventually, this did lead to the 
Now you know why she's the clerk of session. <laughs> the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, over time, gave way to the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is something that we use as a foundation of our faith. 218 words, to be exact. If I can have Tara pull up on the screen the next screen for me. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth and of all things, visible and invisible. And, the one, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten of the Father from all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father, through him all things were made. I'll go to read that in the back. <laughs> for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered uh, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. We believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. By the way, that's, that's derived from the apostles. Catholic is universal. We believe in one universal and one church driven from the, the, uh, the apostles. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and a life in the world to come. Now, what might be in our book of confessions might be slightly different, but that is the foundation of our faith. It is just a few words that change here and there. Pretty basic, is it not? Is there anything else that we think we should add to that statement that would further define our faith, that would be important to, to the understanding of what we believe? This is one of those times you won't be in trouble if you say, yeah, we need to add. You have to be good looking too. Whatever. So that pretty much covers it all and suffices as a foundation for what we believe. We have, as Presbyterians, complicated things, as every denomination does. Through the ages, we have come up with confessions, not just as Presbyterians, but as Christians. Confessions which explain what it is that we believe. As Presbyterians, we've collected these confessions that are important to us and have come up with a book of confessions, of which the Nicene Creed is first, the Apostles' Creed comes next, and we start going through history of all the different phases of our understanding and development as Christians. We've added to our faith, not only that, but then we had this gentleman come along by the name of John Calvin, who wrote the Institutes. <clears throat> and every good seminary student, Presbyterian seminary student, knows these pretty well. We get very familiar with these two guys. Are these necessary to add? Do these make that Nicene Creed, do they add to it and, and make it more complete? I guess it depends on who you ask. The Nicene Creed, in its entire form, is complete and good enough as the foundation of our belief. And there really is nothing else that we need to add. But it is a foundation of our belief. So then why? Why do we go and add things to it? Why do we make it more complicated? What was Paul addressing to the Corinthians? What was going on in Corinth that was causing them to struggle to keep things simple? The answer is, we can't stop picking at the threads. We get the foundation, we get it, we got it, but then we want to know a little bit more. We start digging a little deeper. In the statement of faith, we start with God, we move to Jesus, and then we finish with the Holy Spirit. Case in point, that pulling at the thread, the digging deeper, the wanting to know more, this, the, the statement, the Nicene Creed says that the Holy, we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Well, that was quite a, a schism in the early church. It led to the first great schism between the East and the West because 
from the Son was added in as we developed our understanding of the Holy Spirit a little bit more, what we call filioque, the Son, from the Son. And the Church of the East and the Church of the West didn't agree on this. The Church of the East said, no, the Spirit only comes from the Father. The Church of the West said, no, it comes from the Father and the Son. And eventually that became the straw, one of the straws that broke the camel's back. And the East and the West divided. You've heard the saying, the East is East and the West is West, and there the twain shall meet. We're talking about that great schism, the first great separation of the church. As we tried to understand the Holy Spirit, we struggled in all the minor intricacies that are contained therein. As we struggled to understand Christ, the early church grasped and, and wrestled with, how do we understand Christ? Was he fully God or was he fully man? Our first heresies were all upon that question. Is Christ God or is he man? And we struggled with the mystery of how Christ could be both fully God and fully man, fully human at the same time. It really should not surprise us that the early church had conflict. Just believing in the foundational statement is helpful. The Apostles' Creed and then became the Nicene Creed was helpful. It got us into uh, believing in a very common statement of faith a very common set of beliefs, but it did take us long to begin to ask questions, to dig a little deeper, to try to understand God a little bit more. The church and the world still struggle. We are going through tremendous change right now. As we look across the church and all across America, we see America's churches failing, dwindling in numbers, graying in color, not really doing a good job reaching out to the younger generations. This is a challenge that we are facing yet again, and we need to be ready. We need to know how we explain what we believe and why. We need to be ready to share what is needed for somebody else to believe, what it is they need to believe in, without all the complications that we have built into our faith. This isn't a new struggle. This is a struggle that we've been in time and time again, where the church does really good, and then it starts to waver and, 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 and wane, and then we'll, we'll, we'll grow and grow and grow, and then we'll, we'll diminish and diminish. I think I just used the wrong word, but nonetheless, we grow and then we get smaller, and we grow and we get smaller. I call this the judges cycle. If you go back to the judges, or judges in the, in the Bible, the Old Testament, you saw there that about every 70, to 80 years, they would have a problem where they would turn away from God. It says over and over again, and the people did what was evil in the sight of God. And God would turn them over to their oppressor until they got so tired of the oppressor they would call for God, oh God! And God would send a judge, a Samson, a Delilah, a, uh, uh, what? Deborah. Deborah. Okay. If you don't like Deborah, you can have Deborah. <laughs> God would send a judge that would come and free them from their oppressors and they would be free again returning to God and it would last for a little while if the judge was a righteous judge a good judge they'd have 40 years of peace which 40 was really a number of completion they'd have complete peace if the judge was doubly righteous they'd have double they have 80 years or double completion if the judge was a scoundrel like Samson they'd have 20 years of peace Every so often they would go through a cycle where they'd move away and they come back to God. In America we've had three great awakenings in our history, plus the unprecedented revival of the 50s. We grow and grow and grow, but then we would decrease and decrease and close churches and lay off ministers. And then all of a sudden the revival would come and we'd grow yet again. We're in the middle of that cycle now. We're in that cycle where we are diminishing in our, in our, in our uh, numbers, we're diminishing in our faith, and we are coming back to a time when hopefully we will be reaching out and calling out for God yet again. Change is coming. And we need to be ready to offer simple explanations for our faith. It is time when 
change is needed and we need to be aware of what is common in our beliefs. We need to let go of that which is different because more unites us than divides us. We are one people, one faith, under one God, who is the God of all gods, through whom all things were made. We believe in one Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received our forgiveness. We are imbued with one Spirit that came with the power of the Father and the Son. We believe in the life that is to come. After this life, there will be an eternal life. These are the foundations of our faith. Everything else is extra. Maybe it's important. I don't want to diminish its impact or its importance, but it's not necessary for our right relationship with God, our Creator. It is time to be about what is common and foundational. Let there be no divisions among us. Let us now be united, both here at Geneva and with our brothers and sisters in all places. Let us be united with the same mind and with the same purpose. To the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, it is true that more unites us than divides us, and at times that's hard to see. At times we let that go, and we have division, we have differences. Help us to put those differences beside. Help us to focus on you. To show the world a God that is bigger than all of our squabbles. Help us to see how we can reach out to a new generation to share your love, to bring about change once again. Let your spirit come, fall upon us, and bring revival. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, would you please stand as we sing our final hymn?